Hi folks, Human Performance Outliers Podcast conducts long-form interviews with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. These interviews often dive into a wide range of topics, so we are happy to present some mini clips. These clips will be specific questions asked to our guests that stand alone. If you'd like to hear more, head over to the show notes for a link to the full episode. So, Dr. Seyfried, so for people that don't know uh, your background a little bit, maybe we can just kind of give you a little bit of a chance to talk about that. Uh, you've done some very exciting work uh, around cancer. And one of the things you're kind of bringing up uh, something that uh, Otto Warburg had talked about in the 19, I believe, 20s when he, I think he was a Nobel Prize winner when he discovered that cancer preferentially metabolized glucose. And you've, you've kind of piggybacked on that and, and come up with a lot of interesting stuff around there with some really interesting research. Can you give us a quick little, I know I know you've written a huge book on this, so telling you to condense this stuff into a quick intro might be hard, but I'd like to talk a little bit about that and then let's get into some of the details. And then I'd also like to talk about your recent trip to Hungary. I don't know if you know, Zach, uh, Dr. Seyfried just got back from Hungary. He was meeting with the uh, folks at the Paleo Medicina Group who we had on the podcast the other day. So it'll be interesting to kind of get this combined perspective. So uh, Dr. Safer, if you don't mind, just kind of give us a quick little intro on what, what you're up to. Well, um, you know, I'm a professor here at Boston College, and um, we do basic uh, preclinical research in, in cancer, and we also do preclinical research on lipid storage diseases like Tay-Sachs disease. And we've had a very active program for many years in the field of epilepsy. And most of our work involves trying to manage these diseases using metabolic therapies in combination with drugs. So uh, it's kind of a new approach, especially for cancer, um, where you know the traditional uh, approach to management, you know, which is uh, chemo, radiation, surgery, and this kind of stuff, has um, has not had any major impact uh, over the years. So uh, something really has to be done. You have to realize that I don't think most people realize it's not discussed almost anywhere that we have over 1,600 people a day in the United States die from cancer. Um, I don't think a lot of people know that. The, these numbers come from the American Cancer Society. And every time they get on to talk about something, they're telling everybody how wonderful the progress is. But then they publish all this information showing all these dead people. And um, you say to yourself, you know, what's going on here? So uh, we've made it a mission to see whether or not it's possible to lower the death rate for cancer and uh, by taking a, t a completely different strategy to attack the disease based on its metabolic origin uh, rather than the, um, uh, the downstream epiphenomenal changes called gene mutations. Um, we've shown and others have shown that these mutations are not the cause of cancer, they're the effects. So if they're the effects, then most of what's being done today is probably largely irrelevant. I hate to say that. It's a multi-billion dollar industry that is in a, in a, in a, a rabbit hole. Um, consequently, we have 1,600 people a day dying from the disease. And I think people need to know that there are other alternatives that could potentially, potentially increase survival uh, with less toxicity. So that's where we are. That's what we do. Yeah, one of the things that, you know, and, I, and I've kind of read quite a bit about some of the stuff you're up to, and, you know, one of the things we have this somatic, you know, DNA mutation that, that supposedly think, people think that cancer comes from that. And, you know, when we look at these cancer cells, uh, they are so wildly different. Even, even one cell to the next has different mutations. So yeah. it makes it very hard to have this targeted gene therapy that people talk about and try to target the drugs because it just doesn't make sense. And it does make a sense that, it's probably something further upstream that's causing all these different well, mutations. You know, that, that knowledge about, about that has come in large part from the, the cancer genome, um, where we've spent $100 million uh, searching for gene mutations. Um, so, uh, and it's clear that um, you're absolutely right, Sean, that, that every cell in the tumor is a different genetic composition. And then there's some cells in the tumor that, ha that have no mutations. So uh, um, here's a cell growing out of control with no mutation. How do you explain that? And then you have um, normal skin containing all these so-called driver gene mutations. It's normal skin. So you have normal cells growing out of, out of control with no mutations, and you have normal cells full of driver mutations that don't form cancer. So when you start putting all this together, it makes absolutely no sense. And I think the strongest evidence to date 
is the uh, nuclear transfer experiments. That's where you take the nucleus of the tumor cell and put it into a normal cytoplasm and you don't get cancer. On the other hand, if you take the, the, um, the cancer mitochondria and put it into a normal cytoplasm, you, you, get, you get cancer. So, so um, I put those uh, studies together and they're the strongest evidence to date to say that cancer cannot be a genetic disease. So once you make that decision, once, once that statement becomes known and appreciated, it becomes clear that the majority of what we're doing makes no sense. Is a, is a, is, I don't want to say it's a complete waste of time, but I would certainly say time and energy could be spent better uh, looking at the real origin, which is a metabolic problem. What, you know, I know you've pointed to it, and I know you've called it a mitochondrial metabolic disease in the, in the past. And why do you think that it's the, the mitochondria? We're, you know, I know the mitochondrial transfer uh, data would, would, would certainly point to that. Is there any other thing else going on? And why do we think that mitochondria, what's happening to the mitochondria? Can we say well, what's going on? Well, you know, our cells are all regulated energetically. I mean, every cell in our body has a, has a very disciplined energy to do, to perform its, its vital functions. You know, liver cells perform a particular function, brain cells, colon cells, breast cells, they all do it. And that's all energetically regulated and gene controlled in, inside the cell. But ATP, energy, is the prime, prime um, uh, driver of everything that we do. Now, most of the energy comes from respiration. We breathe in oxygen and the cells make energy in a very disciplined and coordinated way. Well, that organelle that makes that energy becomes corrupted in cancer. And that can be corrupted from carcinogens, radiation, hypoxia, um, you know, uh, viruses, um, even inherited gene mutations. Uh, but those inherited gene mutations only cause cancer if they damage the respiration. So you take BRCA1, for example, um, that you hear a lot about, and P53. Those gene inherited mutations only cause cancer only if they damage the respiration. So you have people walking around with those mutations who don't have cancer. They're what they call non-penetrant because for whatever reason, the mutation in that person did not damage the mitochondria in a particular pop cell. So everything goes through the mitochondria. Without, There is no cancer that we know of that has normal respiratory function. That's a fact. So, uh, so clearly, uh, damaging the respiration, followed by, as Warburg said, a compensatory fermentation. Because if the mitochondria become damaged, the cell dies. But if the mitochondria are chronically damaged over a period of time, the cell adapts, upregulates fermentation, and stays alive. The problem is there's a complete dysregulation of energy and the cell morphs back into a very primitive kind of existence, uh, being driven by ancient pathways of fermentation. And they use glucose and glutamine as the prime fuels for driving the disease. So the strategy then becomes a relatively simple one. Deprive this cancer cell of glucose and glutamine, and it cannot make ATP and cannot make energy and therefore dies. And the rest of the cells are burning ketone bodies, and they survive while the cancer cell starves. That was one of the questions that I kind of had for you too, and because I think like when when our listeners like tune into this this podcast, I think there'll be a question on the top of their heads as well. Is a lot of the the talk within like I guess the ketogenic community or the health nutrition community has been like the efficacy of a ketogenic diet or a um, low to zero carb approach in order to kind of starve off these these cancer cells or I guess more or less. Um, stop this tumor growth and um, as that stuff has gotten I guess a little more out in the open there's discussion about well that's that's good for certain types of cancer but maybe not all of them there's some kinds that can actually uh, I guess use use fat or um, other 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 areas instead of sugar and, and still grow is that something that is um, is that something that's still worth exploring or looking into more or what are the kind of the, I guess, the most update current findings with that type of stuff? Well, most of that's based on, on cells growing in culture. So uh, most of that kind of evidence. And um, so let's, let's dissect uh, what you, what you just said, because some parts of it are true and some parts of it are, are not, not accurate. So um, can some cancers grow without sugar? And the answer is yes. Okay, and they're and they're burning glutamine. They're fermenting an amino acid. They're, they're so if you take away all the glucose, these cancer cells are still there. They may not be growing quite as fast, 
but they're still there and they are still growing and they are using glutamine as the fuel, okay? So you can only half starve them if you try to take away glucose. There's other cancer cells that use predominantly glucose. And when you use ketogenic diets or, or, or uh, glucose lowering strategies, you will kill the majority of those kinds of cells, right? Mm -hmm. And then there are many cancer cells that use both glucose and glutamine. So in order to kill the beast, you have to take away its two primary fuels. If you take away just glutamine and not glucose, you, the, the cell is going to survive on the glucose, you know, it's vice versa. So you, you got to get both of those fuels together. The reports that cancer can use fatty acids or ketone bodies would only depend on having a cancer cell with a normal mitochondrial restoration. All right. You need normal mitochondria to burn fats and ketone bodies. And as I said, we have never found a cancer cell that is a completely normal respiration. Mm. So if we're giving fats to and uh, to someone in, 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 ca in cancer cell in culture, which is a completely um, um, un unnatural environment. Our cancer cells don't exist in a, in a Petri dish. They exist in our body, all right? So if I give a lot of fat to a cancer cell growing in a Petri dish, all of a sudden you see it start growing faster. And you say, oh, the cancer cell is using fats to grow. What is known is the fats un uh, even further uncouple mitochondrial respiration, forcing them to use more glucose and glutamine. So it's not the fat that's causing them to grow faster. It's the glucose and glutamine induced by the fat. They can't burn fat. They can't burn ketones. So they have to burn either glucose and glutamine. So it all comes back to mitochondrial function. So, um, so that's the mis misunderstanding that a lot of people have. A lot of the things you hear about are coming from cell growing in culture. Because let's be honest, if fats made cancer cells grow faster, then anyone with cancer taking a ketogenic diet should have that cancer blow through the roof. They should be dead very quickly. That never happens. So um, so how do you explain that? Well, these people are eating fat and their tumors are getting smaller. Well, where the hell is the evidence that the fat is making the tumor grow faster? Makes no sense. So what happens is you have to dis disassociate stuff. Is that evidence coming from cell culture work or is that evidence coming from animal studies or human human studies? And then you have to make the decision based based on that. But it is true that people taking ketogenic diets in all likelihood probably could not cure their cancer. Now, it doesn't mean they can't live longer, but it's unlikely. I have not seen um, a, a, a diet strategy cure cancer. Now, I'm not saying I have, I, I just, I think there are people out there that might have been so fortunate to have that happen to them. But um, without targeting that glutamine, in my mind, it's going to be very hard to completely resolve the disease. This is, although I have to be honest with you, I've seen some rather spectacular responses to this more more so than i've ever uh, could imagine and i some, sometimes say i don't know how the hell it's happened but uh because i've never seen that in our preclinical systems we have never cured a mouse using meta cancer uh using ketogenic diets ever now we slow it down the mice lives longer but we've never cured and and um uh because we're not targeting glutamine i think the future will be when you target both of these we might we might have a, pot a potential to resolve the disease. Thanks for checking out this clip from our long form podcast. If you enjoyed these and would like to support the show, please head over to patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast or paypal.me forward slash HPO pod for non-reoccurring donations. Thank you for your support.